good? Okay. Okay, wonderful. Good. Awesome. Madam Vice President, pleasure to meet you. Thanks good for your to time today. Ryan. Our audience appreciates your time as well. Of course. Great. As you know, we're sitting here in a state and arguably in front of an audience that 54 days from now could decide the outcome of this presidential election. You hear it more than I do. People want to know more about you and about your specific plans. At the debate the other night, you talked about creating an opportunity economy. I wonder if we can drill down on that a little bit. When we talk about bringing down prices and making life more affordable for people, what are one or two specific things you have in mind for that? Well, I'll start with this. Um, I grew up a middle class kid. My mother raised my sister and me. She worked very hard. Um, she was able to finally save up enough money to buy our first house when I was a teenager. Um, I grew up in a community of hardworking people, you know, construction workers and nurses and teachers. And I try to explain to some people who may not have had the same experience, you know, if, it, but a lot of people will relate to this. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood of folks who were very proud of their lawn, you know, and, um, and I was raised to believe. When we talked about this on After Hours yesterday, I thought I was tweaking. I thought it's just because I was tired, because I was sleepy, and that I didn't know <laughs> we had the giggles and everything like that. So I said, you know what, Anton, let me get the remastered version, and uh, I'm going to put it through, and we're going to review it today, and so maybe I'll get some better context. Because I didn't even understand why she said that she grew up with people that really, really liked their lawn. Let me rewind this one more time just to understand the context, because this, this reminds me of what happens during the ABC debate. They asked her a question. She was the first, word, first person to get that question. She never answered the question. She word saladed her way all the way through a bunch of nonsense. And then we just got totally distracted from the original question. But I caught it. I remembered it. Let me rewind this a little bit just to understand this. Real quick. Same experience, you know, if, if, but a lot of people will relate to this. You know, I grew up in a neighborhood of folks who were very proud of their lawn. And she looked like some ditz, <laughs> ditzy person. <laughs> and I remember, y'all, because I don't want y'all to get distracted. We live in a social media era where everything is instant. So we, we often get distracted and we get caught up in a word salad. The question is, what are two specifics that you will do that will ultimately help people in this opportunity economy instead of just giving us this broad overview of somehow being able to change people's lives dramatically within the middle class. Now, I know what Trump said. Trump said, listen, we got to audit the federal government. We need to reduce taxes across the board. We need to have mass deportation. We need to cut overtime or, or cut taxes on overtime, anything over 40 hours. We need to do all of these different things, right? No taxes on tips, no taxes on Social Security, which she stole her, those talking points. So, and she's talking about, you know, dealing with people that was really proud of their lawn. Come on, man. What you going to do for the middle class? You know? And, um, so and I was raised to this believe and to know that all people deserve dignity. And that we as Americans have a beautiful character. You know, we have ambitions and aspirations and dreams. But not everyone necessarily has access to the resources that can help them fuel those dreams and ambitions. So when I talk about building an opportunity economy, it is very much with the mind of investing in the ambitions and aspirations and the, and the incredible work ethic of the American people and creating opportunity for people, for example, to start a small business. Um, my mother you know, worked long hours and our neighbor helped raise us. We used to call her, it was, I still call her, our second mother. She was a small business owner. I love our small business owners. I learned who they are from my childhood. And What kind of small business owner was she, Cam Cam? What kind, did she sell books? Was she a contractor? Did she go and get the government contracts? Did she mow lawns? Did she crochet? What does that mean? Yo, listen, you are already a small business owner. You don't even know it. If you do anything outside of your regular job and you get paid for it, you're technically a sole proprietor, okay? These are people, her and Tim Walls have never worked in private industry, have never created 
an opportunity economy for themselves. They've been paid by the taxpayers their entire lives. So when, did they, what did they do? Did they sell cameras? Was, was she a, she sell waters on the side of the road? What, what? And then you can make it official by filing paperwork with your state to then make it an LLC so that you can separate, right, responsibilities. And it's the same way. It files on your taxes the same way. You got to file it on a Schedule C. It all goes into an adjusted gross income. That's the final number that you then get taxed on, whether or not you made money or you lost money. And then you reduce the tax burden according to whatever it is that you make on your regular job by how much that you made or loss with your regular business. You file an LLC in order to remove liability from your regular life from whatever it is that you're doing, and then there you go. There you go, costs you less than $100 depending on what state that you live in to go ahead and file your LLC. You are now a small business owner. What the hell does that mean, bro? What does it mean? Though this is, this is, and I told y'all this last night, and I said this for the people that was on After Hours. We give these people too much credit thinking that they're smarter than us just because they hold these positions. It's not, bro. We are electing crazy people to run the White House, seriously. And she was a, a community leader. She hired locally, she mentored. Our small businesses are so much a part of the fabric of our communities, not to right. mention, We're really, awesome. I think the backbone of America's economy. So my opportunity economy plan includes giving startups a $50,000 tax deduction. Tax deduction. Is it a tax credit? Is it a tax deduction? What does that mean? Start their small business. It used to be $5,000. Nobody can start a small business with $5,000. You absolutely but can. But investing in people's innovative ideas and giving them the ability to go for it. Um, opportunity economy, economy means, look, we don't have enough housing in America. We have a housing supply shortage. And what that means in particular, there's roughly 1.8 million houses on sale right now. And probably another 4 million people that actually want to sell their homes, but they can't sell their homes because if they give up the interest rate that they got that was lower and then they have to buy a new home, then what's going to happen is they're going to have to finance, refinance at a higher interest rate in the new home and they're going to be paying egregiously more and they mortgage, and then on top of that, our property taxes is going up exponentially in order to pay for the migrant crisis, like what's happening over in uh, Chicago. If you give them $25,000, like they really doing, because I think that that's more for the migrants than us, if they give them $25,000, then what they're going to do is they're going to bake that into the cost of the house. They're going to raise the price of the house. Builders are already giving incentives that's similar to that already. We don't have a housing crisis with regard to the amount of houses available. They have an affordability crisis. People can't go to the store and get a full basket of groceries. People can't fill up their gas tank anymore. They can't even afford to drive to work. They can't afford latchkey. They can't afford childcare. They can't afford all of these things. So they need more money in their pocket. Not more gover government overreach to participate in something so they can fumble it because we already know the government is no notorious for mismanaging funds. Let me let her cook, bro, because we'll be here all day. For so many younger Americans, the American oh. dream is elusive. It's just actually not attainable. So part of my plan is to work with the private sector and housing developers to give them a tax credit, to be able to partner tax with credit. us as the government, to build, and my goal is, three million new homes by the end of my first term. In addition, <laughs> to help people who just want to get their foot in the door literally. Mm -hmm. And so giving first time home buyers a $25,000 down payment assistance. And you know what's so funny? We're not getting anything new in this interview. We hear all of these same talking points in a debate. It's literally word for word the same talking points at the rallies. Every single rally has the exact same talking points. No details. Never answered the question. Same thing that she's been saying every single day. And this softball interview is the softest interview that you can possibly get. And she's been talking for three and a half minutes about absolutely nothing looking crazy. To be able to just get in the door and then they will do the work that they need to do to save and to pay that mortgage and to build wealth for themselves and their family. These are some examples of what I mean when I talk about an opportunity economy, and a lot of it has to do with just the community I was raised in and the people 
that I, you know, I admired. Who look up in the sky, work hard, you know, lies, and deserve to have gold, you know, their dreams lies. fulfilled because they're prepared to work for it. You talk at the debate and at previous appearances. I wish somebody would ask her some hard questions about this migrant crisis. This is about turning the page mm -hmm. uh, on the past. And in fact, here today in Johnstown, you're talking about a new way forward. Yeah. I think some people have a question, given maybe your current role as vice president of the United States, how different you are from Joe Biden. And so I wonder if there are one or two spots, policy areas or approaches where you would say, I'm a different person. So now part two question is, how are you different from Joe Biden? Well, I'm obviously not Joe Biden. <laughs> and, um, so much worse you know, I, I offer a new generation of leadership. And so, for example, thinking about developing and, and creating an opportunity economy where more buzzwords, opportunity economy. We heard that seven times again in the last question. It's about investing in areas that really need a lot of work and maybe focusing on, again, the aspirations and the dreams, but also just recognizing that at this moment in time, some of the stuff we could take for granted years ago, we can't take for granted anymore. Um, for example, another um, plan that I have that is a new approach is to expand the child tax credit to $6,000 for young families for the first year of their child's life. Because that is obviously a very critical stage of development of a child. And a lot of young parents need the help to buy a car seat or a crib or clothes for their kids. And so my approach is about new ideas, new policies that are directed at the current moment. And also, to be very honest with you, my focus is very much in what we need to do over the next 10, 20 years to catch up to the 21st century around, again, capacity, but also challenges. What? Crime and... What? Is anybody going to press her on this? Cause, can somebody ask for more details? The question is, how are you different from Joe Biden? Capacity? What the, what the fuck is we talk? What are we talking about? Am, am I the only person that's listening to this with my ears? Public safety are two major issues yeah. uh, right at the forefront of voters' minds in Philadelphia Crazy, as well, where crime is a significant issue. Crazy. When we talk about crime, the conversation turns to gun safety as well. And I think you actually probably caught a lot of people off guard, maybe a bit by surprise in the debate the other night when you mentioned that you are a gun owner. I know you said it in 2019 as well. Yeah. I want to talk about your values on this yeah. issue. When it comes to gun ownership, where do you draw the line in America on gun ownership and gun use? Well, like you said, Brian, they I cannot am... go throw her any more Chris Paul alley oops, Lob City than they ever had before, and she's still fumbling. A gun owner, and Tim Walls, my running mate, is also a gun owner. We're not taking anybody's guns away. I support the Second Amendment, and I support reasonable gun safety laws. Part of my approach to this is I was a career prosecutor for most of my career. I have personally prosecuted homicide cases. I have personally looked at autopsies. autopsies. Yeah. I have personally seen what assault weapons do to the human body. Right. And so I feel very strongly that it is consistent with the Second Amendment and your right to own a gun to also say, we need an assault weapons ban. They're literally tools of war. They were literally designed to kill a lot of human beings quickly. I say we need universal background checks. The majority of NRA members support that. Why? Because it's just reasonable. You just might want to know before someone can buy a lethal weapon if they've been found by a court to be a danger to themselves or others. You just might want to know. Two final questions, if I might. Sure. On the appeal of the man you were running against, as you drove here today, you likely saw a lot of Trump signs. Mm -hmm. He has an historic appeal in this country. And as you are someone running against him and trying to understand that, I wonder how you distill it. What do you understand his appeal to be? And how do you, you may not understand the word distill, so talk slowly. To his voters, or maybe people who just share his values but are open to something else. I, based on experience and, uh, and 
a lived experience? No. In my heart, I know, in my soul, I know that the vast majority of us as Americans have so much more in common than what separates us. And I also... Same talking point on every single rally stop. Same talking point. God, give us something new. Believe that I am accurate in knowing that most Americans want a leader who brings us together as Americans and not Same talking point. someone who professes to be a leader who is trying to have us point our fingers at each other. Mm. I think people are exhausted with that approach, to be honest with you. I think people want a leader who has common sense and tries to find common ground. I'm supported by over 200 Republicans who worked for both Presidents Bush, John McCain, Mitt Romney. I'm supported by the former Vice President Dick Cheney, Congress, former Congress member Liz Cheney. And I think people are more willing now, um, in light of the, the hate and division that we see coming out of Donald Trump to say, hey, let's, let's put country first. <laughs> and I think that just makes us stronger and more healthy as a country. And let me guess, she gonna tell us about, listen, <laughs> let's, let's just go, let's just watch y'all. To say, look, we will- I know all of our speech is by heart at this point. We can all debate our differences around, you know, various policies, but Let's stop with the division, like enough of that. Let's bring everybody together. And finally, as you introduce yourself to America in a new way, they've heard much of your story at the Democratic National Convention in, in that debate earlier this week. If there's one thing that you wish Americans knew about who Kamala Harris is that you don't think they know yet, what would that be? I don't know. I've been... Probably, it's not very different from anybody watching right now. I love my family. Um, one of my favorite things that I lately have not been able to do is Sunday family dinner. I love to cook. Let me guess, it's the greens inside of the bathtub, right, with the bacon? Um, I, I have incredible friends. My best friend from kindergarten is still my best friend. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I have a career that really, and I said it the other day, you know, as a career prosecutor, I never asked a victim of crime, were they a Republican, a Republican or, a Democrat. or a Democrat? The only thing I, I ever asked you them if you okay, is, right? are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I think that's the approach that most Americans want, regardless of who they voted for in the last election, mm -hmm. um, in terms of turning the page and charting a new way forward. Oh, Jesus Christ. I am looking forward. I love, I, yes, I am looking forward to cooking. With the whole family gets involved, the kids each have their role. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Brian. So much. Thank you. Thank you. I can't do this. I, how do y'all? Um, I guess I got to start asking, stop asking how and just start telling you what it is that I think. I'm not trying to understand people no more. I'm just rolling with it. Make sure you guys hit the Patreon link is in the description. Also, shout out to T. Chanley. 40% off your first order plus 20% off for life. I love you guys. I appreciate y'all. Y'all tell me about this softball interview and how you feel about it now that she's starting to step out outside of her CNN interview. I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. I'm going to holler at y'all later. I can't wait to read y'all comments.